China is planning a record number of rocket launches this year, exploring the moon and beyond. We will take a look at the latest in space. Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu and this is The Heat. China took a big step in the exploration of the moon. This past Wednesday, a Long March 8 rocket was launched, carrying a satellite that will serve as a communication relay for the Chang'e 6 mission. That's a probe that will gather, for the first time ever, lunar material from the far side, or the side of the moon, that we can't see from Earth. China is planning for a record 100 launches this year, with growing help from the private sector. CGTN's Wu Li explains. A rise in commercial space ventures is driving the development of liquid-fueled rockets, prized for their eco-friendliness and reusability. China's first commercial liquid rocket, Tianlong-2, had its first flight last April. And now, the second Tianlong-2 rocket awaits assembly in Jiangsu province. Chinese commercial rocket company Space Pioneer is also building the larger and a more powerful Tianlong-3 rocket, having the same capabilities as SpaceX Falcon 9. With a payload capacity of 17 tons to low Earth orbit and 14 tons to sound synchronous orbit, Tianlong-3 is slated for its inaugural flight around mid-2024. Space pioneer founder Kang Yong-lai says there is a significant demand for commercial rockets. We can lower the cost of satellite launch to 20,000 yuan per kilogram. Almost 100 test satellites for Constellation will be launched in 2024. If all succeed, 2025 will witness hundreds or even thousands of satellites launched annually. In 2023, China executed nearly 70 space launches, with private space companies responsible for 20 of them. Besides Space Pioneer, others like Land Space, Orion Space, and Galactic Energy are racing to develop reliable and reusable launch vehicles. In terms of future technological development, I think we need to focus on achieving breakthroughs in reusable technology, innovative material, and new processes that can effectively lower costs. Kang Yong Lai says his company is also developing heavier rockets. It's believed that advanced launch vehicles could one day bring continental travel experiences to consumers around the world. Satellite Internet will play a key role in the 6G and next-generation communication services. This is one of the latest smart satellite factories in Shanghai. Around 300 satellites will be assembled and tested right here per year after 2025. Chinese firms are banding together to build a G60 satellite constellation, comprising over 12,000 small satellites. Cao Jing and his colleagues at the Shanghai Genesat Aerospace Technology Company are now working around the clock to contribute their bid. By 2026, he anticipates producing over 500 satellites per year. Currently, satellite-driven Internet is geared toward large-scale and low-cost infrastructure. So the whole industry needs more innovative technologies to address the challenges of cost-effective mass production. Data from the consultant firm iMedia Research estimates market revenue is projected to exceed 2.3 trillion yuan by 2024. With more companies investing in rockets, satellites and other spacecraft, Many believe the booming space sector will generate huge amount of job opportunities as well as applications in the field of science, medicine, tourism, and education. Wu Lei, CGTN, Jiangsu Province. To help us go deeper into space exploration, let's bring in our panel. From Beijing, Xu Yansong is a former director at the China National Space Administration. Also from Beijing, Yang Yuguang is vice chair at the International Astronaut Astronautical Federation. 
Amitab Ghosh is a planetary scientist. He joins us from Kolkata in India and here in Virginia uh, in the United States. Keith Cowing is a former rocket scientist and editor of nasawatch.com. Welcome to all of you. Xu Yuan Song, let me start with you. So as I said, China plans more than 100 launches this year. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> what will these uh, launches achieve? What's the goal here? Well, I think there are uh, about uh, three aspects that China is trying to maneuver uh, the space activities. Uh, the first area, of course, is deep space exploration. We can see that on Tuesday we had a successful launch of the Chiao 2 which is uh, a replacement of the still currently functioning Chiao one uh, for uh, data relay on the far side of the moon. Uh, that is a uh, layer solid foundation for the lunar missions. And, uh, as so far, we have completed all the three phases of uh, ex uh, explorations uh, and landings and sample returns. And uh, we're going further to the South Pole and the far side of the moon for a sample return missions. Uh, these are, are the uh, deep space exploration perspective. And then on the second area is the con construction and communication of communication networks. And uh, uh, we have also a, a low Earth and medium Earth orbit uh, uh, constellation that needs to be uh, uh, orbited. A uh, number of satellites will be uh, taking place into that areas. A third, of course, is the booming uh, commercial sector. We know that there are uh, six companies that have completed the testing flight of their launchers, uh, including Landspace and uh, many other uh, companies that have also achieved a, a return of uh, the vehicle. And also we see a booming commercial sector for remote sensing, for uh, telecommunications and for uh, observations. So these are the, some of the activities that can fill up the place for the 100 plus uh, launchings of uh, the satellites. So, Yan Song, those lunar launches that you talk about uh, that will be going to the moon and different parts of the moon, they will also pave the way for uh, even more extensive interplanetary travel, wouldn't they? Well, they, uh, the lunar mission is uh, phased into two, play, uh, two phases. We have uh, the first phase, of course, are we are witnessing the orbiting the landing and sample return. Uh, and the second phase is, of course, what we call an in situ study of the South Pole for, uh, for more resources. And this will lay a foundation for the uh, uh, establishment of International Lunar Research Station. That station will include a, uh, a, a, a series of uh, uh, infrastructures that can facilitate the in situ resource uh, studies and, and uh, excavations. And once that is done, it will be used as a stepping stone for deep space emissions. We know that also in uh, in uh, six years, we will have also a manned mission to the moon. Mm. That will be in combination of the in-situ study of the South Pole uh, for water deposits and many other resources mm. for lunar volatiles. And these will be used uh, as a stacking stone uh, for deep, deep space emissions, either robotic or manned. Yu Guang, talking about these lunar missions, China will launch a mission in May uh, that will land in what's sometimes referred to as the dark side of the moon. It's the side of the moon that we can't see from Earth. Um, now, what are the challenges of landing on that particular part uh, of the moon, and what does China hope to learn? Well, you know that if it can be successful, the Chang'e 6 will be the first one of human beings to bring some samples from the far side of the moon. Oh, no, you know, that, uh, like the uh, Chang'e 5, originally the Chang'e 6 is the backup of the Chang'e 5, but this time with a different role. You see that uh, sampling from the far south moon is more difficult as challenging, as you mentioned. Uh, one thing comes from the uh, communication. Uh, Yan Song has already mentioned, because we only can send the uh, command also and get the data from the uh, help of the Magpie Bridge 2 or the Che Chiao 2 uh, data release satellite. Moreover, you see that... Uh, different from the Chang'e 4 mission, which is only a landing and roving mission on the far side of the moon, uh, you know that the Chang'e 6, the ascender, should lift off from the far side of the moon. You know that during the Chang'e 4 mission, we lift off from the near side, so we can get support from the ground stations uh, in China and also in uh, South America. So this time, we can only uh, get the help, uh, very limited help from the Che Chiao satellite, so you can see how difficult is the moreover, you see that we need to rendezvous and talk with the uh, orbiter and returner waiting on the lunar, uh, circumlunar orbit. 
uh, this will be the second time in mm. human being that conduct an amend automatic uh, docking in the orbi uh, lunar orbit. So it is will also be very, very dangerous and challenging. So not only landing on the far side, but also, you know, not lift off uh, from the far side uh, is difficult. And it must be uh, uh, accurate enough to ensure the safe docking. Amitabh Ghosh, um, great to see you. Uh, of the 100 launch missions that we are talking about, 70 will be uh, conducted by the China Aerospace Science and Technology uh, Corporation. The others will be commercial launches. That's just under one third. How significant is that that the private sector is getting involved uh, in this? <laughs> Let's see the landscape. Um, you know, if you saw the last um, US plan, um, there was a, a commercial company, a private company, which went and did this. So bringing the private sector is huge and it is game changing. See, they bring in more cost efficiencies, more accountability. So for example, for the NASA clips mission where uh, there was a landing on the moon, um, NASA just wants the data. I mean, they don't care how you get there. Um, and so, so the private sector, see the idea, the biggest idea today is the ability of launch vehicles. And that reduces the cost to maybe by 95%. And that idea was not because of just private sector thinking. How do you, when you make a car, you design a car and you drive it and, and you produce a million cars here, how can you do um, uh, the economy of scale and the economy of reusability. Huge deal. This is absolutely going to be game changing. Keith, uh, here in the United States, NASA, which is, of course, the state uh, um, agency, they're not conducting any launches themselves. There's now growing reliance on private companies, companies like SpaceX. Um, are we going to see a lot more of that? Well, right now we do a few NASA launches, and that's the giant uh, uh, moon rocket, the SLS rocket. But you're quite correct. Right now, virtually everything that we launch into space is done uh, by the private sector, uh, and deliberately so, uh, because, again, as my guests will agree, you know, the, the space agencies are good at figuring out how to do something for the first time. But to do it on a repeated basis that makes uh, economic sense, they're not very good at it. So that's when you hand it off to the private sector, which is what we're doing here in the States, but it's also being done in Europe, now in China and elsewhere. So it's the, uh, it's the trend of the future. Uh, I want to talk about one specific mis mission, Keith. Uh, last week, SpaceX launched the Starship rocket, but it disintegrated uh, on its return to Earth. But the company hailed that uh, test launch as a success. Um, explain that to us. Uh, what took place there? Well, you used an important word. It was a test launch. And they had a series of things that they're doing with the rocket. They wanted to make sure that you could launch it, that the staging could happen, that the second stage or the Starship itself could go into orbit, do a lot of things up there, and then begin reentry. The reentry was sort of the, 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 the gravy, the sweet spot. But it accomplished all the goals that they had intended to do. Now, they would like to get their rockets back because that's the whole idea to, to reuse them. Mm. But this is an approach where you, you launch more than you sit and think about it, and you can sometimes get your reliability faster if you are willing to fail, which is what SpaceX is doing. But it did, did it give them sufficient data that they required to build these rockets in future? Oh, yeah. they're already rolling up the fourth one to the pad. They're testing it this week. So, yeah. I mean, the whole idea is you launch it, and every time you 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 do a launch, you test you know systems out, you learn something, uh, you validate something that works, and you find things that don't work, and then you repair it. And this is this rocket is a consumer product. It's designed like a car, to be continually improved, which is another big difference between it and a government rocket, which makes it more reliable once you get it working. Amitabh, one of the goals uh, of the Starship, according to the SpaceX owner, Elon Musk, he says it's to facilitate, ultimately, interplanetary uh, travel. He wants to put humans on Mars. Um, NASA wants to take humans back to the moon as well. Um, I mean, how important are these goals, and what kind of time frame are we talking about before we could see humans travel from one planet to another? We could see humans land on Mars, for instance. Yeah. So the Big goal, obviously, which he verbalizes is going to Mars and with humans and going commercially. 
and that has something like right now maybe today it will take 250 billion dollars per passenger to go to mars and then if this thing works and there were 100 passengers flying then maybe the cost will be 200,000 i mean a huge huge i think 10,000 times but they say the, the spaceship has other goals one is point to point um, um, transportation on Earth, so basically you can go from China to Washington, D.C. in 30 minutes. Um, then the, the supporting the U.S. return to the moon. Um, so there also, that this has a big part. And, you know, the moment, if you have something which was $100 and it is available for $2, uh, there will be many, many new uses. For example, NASA, uh, planetary science, they can probably go further out into the solar system, like an Uranus mission, much, much cheaply. So if it is available much cheaply, there'll be many new uses. So this is going to be absolutely a game changer, a technology which was very, very expensive and un, um, you know, very hard to do. It's definitely going to uh, cycle back and be much more reasonable. And so there'll be many uses other than the uses that you um, think uh, that have been talked about. You know, earlier we were talking about China's plans to send humans to the moon. Well, it's planning to send uh, humans to the moon sometime before the end of this decade. That's, you know, within the next five years. I mean, how are those plans coming along? And what's the importance of sending humans to the moon at this time? You see, you can have another example of the United States. They were already been there half a century before, but uh, uh, when they want to go to Mars, there are two opinions. One is to go to the moon, uh, go to Mars to get, uh, directly. The other is to first, uh, you must return to the moon because many technologies must be tested during this uh, return to the moon. So for space capable nations like U.S., uh, Russia, uh, India, China, and Europe. Uh, so the manned missions to the moon is not only very, very, very important for uh, demonstrating and verifying the technologies, but also it has uh, uh, very great returns on scientific research. Moreover, you see that per day, because we've already found water on the lunar sur uh, surface, especially in the South Pole regions, and also uh, in the South Pole regions, there are uh, permanent shadow areas and also long-term uh, sunshine areas. So so these are very ideal places to set up a base there uh, to uh, make people stay there longer. And also, you know, that the materials, including the water, can be used to produce not only propellant and other, uh, other facilities. So uh, this means that in the future, uh, in the long term uh, uh, vision, that the moon can be a post of human being to make it easier for human being to uh, step more into the deeper space. Uh, in the future, uh, maybe there is also space solutions that if we want to go to Mars, uh, we set up our starship, uh, we, our interplanetary ship there, uh, it will be uh, much cheaper than go directly from the Earth, not so uh, similar to the Jupiter and beyond. So uh, I believe that within this century, sooner or later, the human people can have the missions, uh, human missions to uh, Jupiter or even to the icy uh, planets like the uh, Neptune or Uranus. Uh, but if we can make our uh, produ uh, propellants uh, on the moon uh, and also produce our uh, other works there, so uh, it's an uh, alternative uh, solution and make, maybe it is uh, have low cost. So this is a very uh, uh, hopeful future and a hopeful vision. So that is the importance and meaning of the manned mission to the moon. Yan Song, you were talking earlier on about the different kinds of missions that China is engaged in right now. Well, China is also planning to send a constellation of satellites uh, that will act as a communications bridge between Earth and uh, bases on the moon, uh, future moon stations, if you like, but they would also help with communications right here on Earth. Um, what kind of applications are we talking about, and how will this well, improve our lives here on Earth? Well, I think uh, the communication is very important. It has been a, a backbone of uh, uh, many sectors, including uh, banking, uh, uh, televisions, uh, telecommunications, uh, and voice messages, and many others. And now the, it's working very intensively on the Internet. We see a lot of uh, 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 commercial sector that is entering in, in this field, providing uh, internet access uh, even to the mobile phone. So uh, we think uh, sending a, a, a telecommunication constellation uh, to the, uh, to the o low Earth orbit will provide uh, uh, vital infrastructure for people on Earth to communicate. And also, uh, as you mentioned about the uh, communication on the moon, uh, as we have just witnessed on Tuesday that the Churchill 2 
uh, satellite will, has been successfully launched. It will enter into an orbit which is more stable than the Chuchal-1 uh, halo orbit. So it will provide communication not only to the uh, to the moon uh, on the far side and also on the uh, south pole. It will also lay a foundation for future communications on the lunar surface. As we know, that will be intensive, increasingly intensive activity on the lunar surface, either robotic missions or human missions. And these will require a navigation and telecommunication system, not only on the, on the, on the, on the Earth, but also on the lunar surface. Uh, previously, GPS has been providing some um, uh, use for positioning uh, for uh, navigation for even space objects and, and spacecraft. And I think this will also be very important to have an infrastructure uh, on the lunar vicinity where you can provide navigation, stunning communications to your missions so that we can have a more efficient collection of uh, scientific data and also to uh, better command the facility on the lunar surface. So this is probably one of the reasons that we want to establish uh, this communication network uh, on the uh, size lunar orbit. Keith, there's going to be lots of bits of metal that are going to be orbiting the Earth. Uh, I mean, if we look at China, it's launching its constellation of satellites. SpaceX will have its constellation Starlink. Of course, that's used uh, for internet connections. And of course, there's thousands of pieces of what's sometimes referred to as space junk uh, that are orbiting Earth as well. Um, here's how the director of a private space company in the United Kingdom described it. Space debris is, is a big problem for all of us on Earth. There's 10,000 tons of debris in space, near 40,000 objects, all floating around in different orbits, and they are causing congestion in orbit. So, um, Keith, I mean, there we heard it, you know, 10,000 objects, uh, 10,000 tons, rather, 40,000 objects uh, orbiting around Earth. Um, I mean, could this become a serious problem in the future, this kind of congestion? Yeah, it probably is, and we're just realizing that we're maybe one day away from some some bad news from space. Um, it, it's like anything else; you you can't use up more space than you know is safe uh, and not collide with something. And your the graphic that you're showing right now is a perfect example. Yeah. And so we're going to have to start thinking of ways to build spacecraft that, when we're done with them, they come back through the atmosphere and they don't leave a lot of junk. And we have to make sure we don't collide with things. Of course, there's another problem now that when you re bring things back to the Earth's atmosphere and they melt, we may be affecting the Earth's uh, magnetic field. So mm -hmm. it, it, this is a, a, an ecology up there in space, not too much different than down here on Earth. And you have to keep an eye on how you pollute and how you clean up after yourself. And when you talk about bad news, I mean, if there is a collision, will that pose any danger to us down here on Earth? Uh, down here, no. Um, but up in space, uh, it, uh, you can get uh, a little fleck of paint and do, you know, that's big. And, and the size that uh, you, you need to cause damage is rather small because of the immense speeds that things are traveling up there. Mm -hmm. And so the, more of the problem is mostly up in space. But again, sometimes you have satellites that come back to Earth that are not under control. And technically, it could hit somebody, but most of the time it goes into the ocean. But again, there's an ecology, an environment up there that you really you need traffic cops, you need rules of the road and things like that. I think everybody's now appreciating that. Yeah, Song, um, you know, there, of course, are a lot of geopolitical tensions right here on Earth. But when it comes to space exploration, um, are we seeing more international cooperation, especially between the major players, you know, the major countries that are launching uh, rockets and satellites and other craft into space? Well, the emerging countries are uh, launching a number of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, exploration missions. Uh, we know that they're also some commercial players in these uh, sectors. Uh, the international cooperation in, in lunar scenario is somewhat uh, uh, difficult from this perspective because we know that there's an Artemis mission that is uh, sending a number of commercial uh, missions to the lunar surface to facilitate the resources. And then it will pave the way for a, a gateway mission, which is a, a human mission right. uh, for lunar orbit. And then we will have a number of uh, other missions to the moon. So uh, these are not, uh, but yeah. these are working concurrently with Chinese mission. We have, also have the right. International Lunar Research Station that is going uh, at the same time with the lunar surface. 
Okay. I think there, there are areas of cooperation. Amitav, very quickly, I've only got uh, about a minute left. Uh, what about the future of space tourism? What are we going to do in space? So, you know, you set a set a package to somebody on Earth, um, $20,000 or $50,000 for, for a duration of time. What are you going to do in space? I think that's a very big driver. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, if you just say that, like, like Virgin Galactic, you spent 10, 10, 20 minutes in space, yeah. you spent $53 million. Well, will that work? I don't think so. So okay. we have to find something. Maybe the lunar base, uh, if it works out, okay. there'll be something to explore. Okay, that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, everyone.